Okay, good evening. Um, welcome to this University of Hull uh, Blades Maritime Centre um, webinar. And it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Joe Stanley. Um, Joe is very well published on the, what we might call the social history of, um, of seafaring. Um, she's particularly published um, on women at sea um, over the years. Um, she's done a great deal with um, LGBT maritime history. Her book uh, published, I think, 20 years ago. Joe, am I right? Hello, Sailor, The Hidden History of Gay Life at Sea. Yeah, um, yep, it's the anniversary this year. It is, isn't it? Yes. Very much a landmark publication um, in um, the field of what we might call queer maritime history. Um, so it's a great pleasure to um, to welcome Jo back. And her, her talk this evening is very much um, really designed to sort of kick off our contribution to LGBT History Month. Um, and I'd also like to, to draw your attention to Pride in Maritime Day on, um, on February the 28th. That's next Tuesday. So just a couple of uh, practical points before we get started. Joe will speak for, I think, about 45 minutes. Joe, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so Joe will speak for about 45 minutes or thereabouts, um, and then we have some time for questions. The way we're going to do the questions is that you will see on the right of your screen, there is a, a questions box. So if you do have questions, please type them in there and then I will um, ask them on your behalf. It, it makes these things a little easier to manage than um, raising hands and people asking them themselves with all the, the technological confusion that that can cause. So if you do have questions, yes, please type them into the questions box and I will pose them to, to Joe afterwards. So without further ado, I um, will hand over to you, Joe. Looking forward to hearing this. Thank you very much, Martin. Hello, everybody. So the title is, as it says on the screen, Entertaining for Sanity at Sea. And I'm talking about glitzy seafarers and their impact on morale, particularly focusing on Hull's ship steward, Roy Wendy Gibson, but thinking about him in the context of the history of shipboard entertainment. Next slide, please, Claire. So what this is about is about fun making on ships. So entertainment by shipmates, mainly for shipmates, not something done by professional entertainers as it is today. It also happens to be the history of a really unique UK gay period 1950 to 1985 in maritime history. This is a very British story, very unusual. And it also happens to be a time now in 2022-23 when maritime mental health has become a more major concern than ever before. So the contents of this talk is I'll initially be talking about Wendy, that's what he was normally called, and he used the pronoun he, and Larry, who was also called he, who were leading UK GBT seafarer entertainers and therefore therapeutic agents, people who made a difference to people's mental well-being. So then I'll be going on to talk about Wendy and Larry in context, so entertainment on other ships in other periods, then how creative recreation can help sanity at sea, tackling music, and then humour, and then theatricals. Um, in case it's not clear, I'll be summarising where and how and why queer fits into this picture. And then in the conclusion, I'll be saying a bit more about how you can explore more, some, some resources you can use. Uh, so sit back and enjoy it. I must say I've found that writing about fun has been a very fun process. So I'm hoping that it will be enjoyable for you listening to it. Next slide, please, Claire. So as well as being a maritime history writer and consultant, as Martin mentioned, uh, and learning from a million stories from marginalized seafarers about their lives, and supporting equality, diversity, inclusion. I also happen to be a creative historian, which means I really like dressing up. I like swashbuckling. This is me as a pirate when my book on women pirates came out and I have an MA in modern drama. I think if I wasn't a maritime historian, I'd be trying to be a theater director. 
And I now, since COVID, happen to be training as a counsellor and work as a Samaritan. Samaritan. So I'm really interested in people's mental well-being, and I'm particularly associating that with seafarers. Thank you, Claire. Next slide. So this section is me talking about Wendy and Larry, who were leading UK GBT seafarers who entertained and who healed in the process. Next slide, please, Claire. So they were divas and maritime legends. So Wendy was on the ferries in the 1970s and 80s going between Hull and Rotterdam. Uh, he was born in 53 and died in 2021. And our other person is Larry Pella, or uh, sometimes Larry Bellchamber, who was much older than Wendy. He lived from 1923 and died in 2016, and he was on liners and cruise ships, so he was involved in much more big shows in the floating palaces going on very long trips, particularly to Australia in the 1950s and 60s. Next slide, please, Claire. So Wendy was uh, likened to Liberace, the very flashy pianist who wore sequin jackets and had a fantastic smile. And Wendy turned into Dr. Fun and a paratrooper hero too. He was born in 53 and he grew up in a blended Hull family because his mum married again. Uh, Jeanette, his sister, says he was always in trouble with his twin, Charlie. From his teens, he knew he was gay and he was at sea mainly for a lark because he liked larks. And anyway, he played the piano, including in pubs, but also on the special gay nights that happened one Friday a month on the Norland, which was his ferry. He died in 2021 and had a very splendid funeral with both glitz and paras on motorbikes escorting the cortege. Next slide, please. So how did Wendy boost morale? Well, as a steward, he was joking with 900 male soldiers, two para going outwards, and then coming back from the Falklands, uh, he was with three para as well. So he was on the piano leading uh, this sing-along, this Liberace style honky-tonk piano, roll out the barrel, long way to Tipperary, and he was very open and camp about being who he was, but also being tough too. So as he said to me once, Joe, I may be a, I may be a puff, but I'm also a man, and he was very proud of being involved in the war effort. So on the ship, uh, he was offering a the hospitality that stewards always offer, but also a kind of mothering. He referred to the troops as my boys, not least because they were quite a lot younger than him. And he used a lot of innuendo and humour for dispelling the suspicion that happened because these paratroopers, particularly the young ones, were not used to somebody being queer and respect worthy. So Wendy handled it a bit like the movie Carry On Cruising, if you've ever seen that. Lots of cheeky banter. Next slide, please, Claire. So this is a cartoon about the atmosphere on the ship, the peculiar contrast between the style of a ship, perhaps not so much the Norland, but some of the floating palaces like Canberra and QE2. So on the one hand, there was the paratroopers with all their weapons getting more and more war ready. And on the other hand, were the stewards doing their normal job and being stewards, being part of a very out and camp community. So on the one hand, on these outbound troop carriers, you had the stress of macho uh, relationships, uh, peer pressure to always be manly and up for whatever danger was ahead. And of course, fear of faraway war, so many thousands of miles away, and also the fear of what next. But on the other hand, there was the healing aspects, the camp hospitality, you know, a homely ship on, when it was a ferry, as Wendy's was, the humour, the fun, some trust, quite a lot of affinity and inclusion. So what's often said about LGBT 
GPT men on ships at that time is he may be queer, but he's our queer, meaning we will defend him. He's one of us. He is not to be denigrated. Next slide, please, Claire. So Wendy was one of the people who was uh, a solo performer who was playing to groups of passive-ish participants. He was not part of the big theatricals that can happen on the so-called gay heavens that happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s and early 80s. So he was going, he was with troops going out around to war in 1982. He was finding that the usual camp, in fact, all the, all the gay crew were finding that the usual camp batter, banter didn't go down very well with these macho soldiers tensing up as they neared their confrontation. So Wendy says, I don't know what came over me. I decided to dress up in drag and play the piano for the toms. So he, this was unusual. You know, there wasn't regular piano entertainment on the ship except on gay nights, but they had Seafarer's Mission piano on board. So Wendy says, I thought they needed something to keep their morale up. They may be homophobes and public servants going to face battle, but as hosts, Wendy felt it was our job to look after them the best they could, even if they were behaving in a homophobic way initially. Next slide, please, Claire. So this is Wendy in his later life when he was being filmed. And he said he, I should entertain, he, that he thought I should entertain them the only way I knew how. So I put on an emerald green dress, shooshed up my hair, put on some dangly earrings and a bit of slap, meaning makeup, on my face. He wheeled the piano into the bar. Initially, the paras looked at us like we'd come from a spaceship, talk about oil and water, not mixing. But he played the familiar tunes, like knees up Mother Brown. And he says, before long, I had them eating out of my hand. The whole place was singing along. Eventually, I thought I was at Bleeding Butlins. Next slide, Claire. Thank you. So just to remind people of Butlins, in case you're too young to know, these were holiday camps that started from 1936. Uh, it was very organized and very bantering kind of entertainment and the slogans included somebody to look after you always and our true intent is all for your delight so this was the style that Wendy was playing to and I want to compare this to the, the somewhat similar situation on cruise ships after the 60s and 70s as demonstrated in this P&O picture so cruises were selling the experience of a holiday at sea. It wasn't just transport from A to B. Both these things, butlins and cruises, were about temporary communal living away from normal life, fun for the hosts like Wendy as well as guests. And of course, the reason for this is that shipping companies knew that fun, when, when organized in a particular way, brings profits and team harmony and operational efficiency. Next line, please, Claire. So obviously ships were different, um, but it's important to know that long voyages can be tedious and you welcome any diversion whatsoever. It's also important to remember that at this period, it was still illegal to be homosexual and it was very stigmatized too. Uh, so heteronormativity or the welcome for queer people particularly camp people, was very differently present on different ships. So on the queer heavens, um, you had a welcome for camp gay men on cruise ships, on passenger ships, a little bit on ferries, and a little bit on the Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships that served the Navy. But you could not be flamboyantly gay on cargo ships, tankers, and Royal Naval vessels, but Royal Naval vessels did have what were called sods operas, ships, operatic and drama, dramatic societies who put on operas and also the crew were in fufu bands, meaning this is guys who dressed uh, fairly outrageously like pantomime days or Cinderella's Ugly Sisters. Uh, so if you think about Danny LaRue in the past or RuPaul's Drag Race on the telly today. Next slide, please, Claire. 
So there was a range of the shipboard entertainment. So there was what Wendy was doing that he just liked playing the piano. Some people like playing their guitar or using their mouth organ. And their pleasure in just creating the music then led on into their mates saying, oh, give us a tune, mate. And so there could be entertainment in a cabin or even on deck to relieve the boredom. As well as that, there were ad hoc variety shows which took place in the crew bar and many people would take a turn in just presenting a song or a humorous term. And then there were more unusually, there were full scale musicals like Hello Dolly in the ship's salon or the theatre. So three very different levels of entertainment in terms of commitment and time and rehearsal. Next slide, please, Claire. So this is a picture of a variety show with the skits and the songs and the comedians. And one of the people I've interviewed, Sid Ewins, who was both on the Andes, which was known as the Queer Ship Afloat, and was also on the Hull Ferries later. He said, passengers were out for a good time. The sea then was a completely different life with more freedom of mind and perverts were welcome if they made light of things, if they made the trip go with a swing. Next slide, please, Claire. There was also theatricality off stage. Um, so Eddie, a cook, said to me that camp stewards were very playful and daring. Judy, one of his friends, who was a man, but men use their, their female names. Judy acted melodramas using curtains over portholes with a linen napkin over her head. Passengers loved it. In the dining room, waiters with subtle mascara, subtle lipstick, subtle nail varnish, and sometimes a bit of glittery hairspray would pirouette and clown while waiting at table. So the passengers got comedy as well as food as they dined. And there's also ironic flirting. And two people have told me this story, one about a gay male steward and one about uh, a lesbian woman steward. So the steward would come in with the early morning tea for the seafarer as arranged, like at you know, 5.30 a.m. or something. And they would, they would uh, come to the door with the tea and they would make this joke threat. If you don't get up, right now I'm going to jump into that bed with you. So the correct response in sort of pantomime style was, oh no, don't do that. I, I find it fascinating that, that gay people were using this funny, jokey way of handling uh, the fact that they were in a way pantomime monsters who would force you into doing something else. So, also, the ad hoc theatricality included cross-dressing in cruise cabin parties and starring in off-ship off -ship events. So this is a picture of an off-ship event, probably the most spectacular in, uh, in British maritime history. This is uh, an engineer steward whose nickname was Pagan because he wore a perfume called Pagan. He was on the Coronia and they went to Bergen. And when they were stopping at Bergen on this Norwegian cruise, uh, the two uh, ship's football teams from the two restaurants on the ship decided that they were going to play a match ashore in Bergen. So they arranged for a float. Uh, in the bottom picture, you can just see the Sphinx coming along. It was carried by about 12 men, shoulder high. And Pagan was Cleopatra. Liz Taylor had just made the film Cleopatra. And so for one day, Pagan was this famous star. He was, in effect, Liz Taylor, who was the height of glamour at that time. Next, please, Claire. Um, so Della, one of the other stewards I've talked to, but slightly later, who was on the Pacific Princess, which was used in the Love Boat series on TV that you may remember. Um, Della talks about how you had to make fun for yourself. So when he was in Seattle in 1988, he bought a special kind of marigold gloves, the gloves you wear for doing your washing up and dusting. And he said that they had fingernails and a golden diamond ring. Um, 
and these looked absolutely hilarious with with the stewards relatively sober white uniform and he Della says giving people a laugh fun even the old time camp bit wasn't really necessary it was just like you had to do things to make the fun to make the goage go the voyage go well so you looked for things for opportunities all the time to make fun next slide please claire By contrast, uh, Larry Bellchamber, the other steward I mentioned, was involved in semi-professional musicals, full length uh, musicals of one and a half to two hours, normally uh, modeled on a musical that they had just seen on Broadway and was just being successful. So Larry was on the Andes, the queerest ship afloat, and this is him in a version of the Easter Parade. This is a version that's done for the passengers and he's pretty sure that the figure uh, in roughly in the middle in the audience on the front row, uh, bald, was, was the captain. It was normal for senior officers and the captain to watch the passenger show version of these musicals but actually there was a a ruder version too uh, that was put on for the crew and then it was cleaned up for the passengers. Not too much innuendo, not too much uh, explicit reference to gay sex. Next slide, please, Claire. So Larry was a seafarer who was in some ways an ordinary guy, born in 1923. 1923 in a little village. His dad was a bus driver. His mum worked in a sweetie factory. Um, just at the start of World War II, when he was a very young lad, he became a boy sailor in the Royal Navy. He had two gay brothers, one on TV later after the war. And Larry worked from 1944 to 1969 as a waiter and a bedroom steward, not just on the floating palaces, but on tankers too. And he described some of the things he did to improvise as an actor, which included making false eyelashes by uh, sticking hair that you cut off your friend's head and uh, putting them onto sellotape and then sellotaping them onto your eyelids. You can imagine how uncomfortable this was was they also made wigs from dyed rope but because the performances were happening in quite intensive spaces that were very hot often the dye from the rope uh, trickled down their faces so shows could become increasingly hilarious and ramshackle uh, larry died in 2016. Um, larry was also a diva he was the producer and director and, and the star of some shows on ships. He had briefly trained at RADA but didn't carry on and he even did a season at the very new Shakespeare Theatre at Stratford-on-Avon so he was really at the top in the cultural end of theatricality and it was he knew people, stars like Moira Shearer. Um, it was a very different world to Wendy's ad hoc community venues and when I met Larry, I always felt that I should be wearing um, white kid uh, elbow length gloves. It, he was a very sophisticated person and I guess I never felt dressed up enough, ladylike enough for his taste. Next slide, please, Claire. So talking about Wendy and Larry in context, other ships, other seas. Next slide, Claire. Just to remind you of some other people in their music making. This is Leonard Hussey, who was on Shackleton's Antarctic expedition, uh, which happened to be during World War One. And although he was the doctor and meteorologist, he was also a very cheery, jokey kind of person. And when the endurance had to be abandoned, Sir Anna Shackleton said, every man could only carry two pound of bare essentials with him. But, uh, Hussey was different. He had a 12 pound zither banjo and Shackleton said it must come because it's vital mental medicine. We shall need it. So there was this recognition of the importance of music and funniness with the music. Next slide please Claire. Uh, so people would also strum in foo-foo bands 
I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm aware of the time going and I want to give you time for questions. And a very important aspect of this dressing up as women at that time was that the women were a little bit grotesque. So the theatre play from the 1890s, Charlie, Charlie's Aunt was a really important model. British, the tradition of British farce was coming in and playing a role in the kind of entertainment that was happening on ships. And these were interludes of topsy-turviness like the Neptune ceremony. These were allowed spaces and periods where it was okay to be fun and funny and to look like a woman but not be accused of being gay. Next slide please Claire. So this is some more pictures of the cross-dressing. This was happening on Royal Naval ships in the Sods operas. So you can see that it was really silly clothing uh, and then the wedding scene is a very serious, dramatic production, but also there was the cross-dressing on deck, the horsing around and dancing. Next slide, please, Claire. So just to remind you of entertainment on ships, for centuries, people have entertained each other on vessels with songs and jokes and sometimes playing an instrument if they have one. Shanties became used as a way to aid your breath when you were doing physical work, particularly tugging at the capstan. And slowly musicians came to be on board. So on the Sirius, which was one of the very early steamships, musicians were given, a few musicians were given free trips in return for performing. Um, by the 1870s, passengers were setting up and ship sports and entertainments committee supported by the purser on a ship and they would be giving concerts to each other. So this was passengers rather than crew, but crew might get to attend. By the 18, 1880s, entertainment was recognised as so important that musicians were actually employed to be stewards. You had a dual role on the ship. But by 1903, actually full-time musicians were there playing in things like palm court orchestras while uh, diners et sedately. So this wasn't raucous stuff. This was genteel and classical. Um, you, we're all familiar with the Titanic sinking and the story that the band played, Nearer My God to Me, as the ship sank. Uh, what's very interesting, I think, is to think of the band being emotion labourers, uh, actually working as stewards and crew would do to help the people on ship, particularly hysterical passengers, feel a bit better about this absolutely terrible situation they're in. And some say that the band was required to play to mask the sound of sobbing that would have demoralised us, some of the passengers who weren't crying at that point. And uh, from the 1970s, on the very cheap cruises, it became more and more common to have fancy shows with entertainers on board all the time or flown out. Today, they're often flown out, but dancers are on the ship for the whole period. And today, entertainers are told, your job is to transport the audience to a magical place. So you have a role to really make a difference to a trip consciously. Next slide, please, Claire. So seafarers played and sang and acted for some of the reasons you've just, you're just seeing here as you're looking through this slide. It's worth saying that the company really approved it. So on the Andes, the queerest ship afloat, uh, the captain was the captain at one point was homophobic, but he had to tolerate uh, the play acting and the musicals because the passengers loved it so much and the company wanted uh, the passengers to have a happy trip. Next slide, please, Claire. So thinking about how creative rec recreation helps our sanity at sea, I'll talk about humour and then musical music and then theatricals. Next slide, please, Claire. 
So let's think about what sanity and well-being means. It means you're relaxed, you can feel hopeful, satisfied if not happy, you know you can solve problems, you can feel a sense of belonging and trust with your uh, shipmates and you can sleep well. Uh, of course not everybody is in the same boat, people have different abilities to cope but in a ship you are in the same storm in effect you're dealing with incarceration and difficult conditions which can include difficult weather. Next slide please Claire. So some of the difficulties that seafarers feel, as we know, uh, sorry, what seafarers experience are concerns about what's happening at home and what trouble people are in and thinking, particularly if their fathers, how to pull people out of it. They're thinking about their hard conditions and the stress on board. It's a very hectic pace on a ship at times. Uh, they're affected by the sea's vastness and some which some people fear, and the movement, the sense that you're not secure. Uh, in these intense cooped up situations, you can have tricky relations with your colleagues and bosses and passengers. And of course, like anybody in any stage of their life experience, uh, illness and age can play a part in how much you're enjoying or suffering in your working day. So stigmatized people, including LGBT people, may also feel lonely, shamed, confused, angry and frightened, especially if they're closeted. Whereas on some of these gay heavens, they were inspired and supported for their first time in their lives. Next slide, please, Claire. So entertainment helps sanity. If you're making the entertainment, um, you're focused, you're diverting your attention and you're contributing your own skills in new ways. For example, the shipboard electrician would have the pleasure of thinking about spotlights and joining in the games and the jokiness, particularly in rehearsals of getting the lighting right for people, as opposed to just being the person who looked after the electric lights in, in the corridors. <clears throat> So you're immersing yourself when you're making. Uh, always the guys were doing the shows for charity, particularly the Seafarers Orphanage. So there was a double benefit. They were feeling that wonderful sense of altruism that you're giving to people at the same time as you're making fun for yourselves. A lot of pride in creating and, and completing a good show was there. And also LGBT people often felt a, a sense of their collective power as the makers of shows that were going to really work for particularly straight people in their audience. There was a sense that they really could give and had superior skills, which helped if you were continually experiencing being treated as inferior. So if you were audiencing the entertainments, you'd be absorbed, you'd be receiving a gift and feeling very kindly done to, which of course made you feel warm towards the makers. They were relaxed, they were just being, they didn't have to do anything. And also, as we know, experiencing art is transform transformational, it changes you. Next slide, please, Claire. So how does entertainment help us, help our well-being? It produces oxytocin, nicknamed the love hormone, which helps you feel attachment and trust. And it also produces dopamine, which people call the feel-good hormone. So you experience a lot of pleasure and you seek more of it. Next slide, please, Claire. So how humour help voyages. The way laughter affects anyone is that it strengthens your immune system, you feel less pain, your heart rate increases and your blood pressure lowers and um, it reduces the stress hormone cortisol, which can um, be such a feature for people on ships who are very worried about their responsibility, such as engineers. So it also creates preoccupying interludes, Poking fun at yourself is a good idea because it helps everyone uh, feel their common humanity. You know, we all make mistakes, we're all idiots sometimes. And also, the more arty it was, the more spiritually uplifting. It helps you forgive yourself and forgive others' imperfections. It creates a lot of empathy, this humour. 
Next slide, please, Claire. Um, Humour particularly helped the gay voyages because it helps subordinated people feel more powerful and more able to survive and be proud. Uh, so there was a sense of us versus them and us winning. It also helped manage the lurking homophobia that was on ships. Not everybody on ship accepted the gays as readily as others. Some felt scared at this very different behaviour. Um, also, humour acts as a collective riposte to subtle hostility, and it brings our values out into the open. For example, the value that knowing that friendliness is better than wearing wariness as a way to get on with your colleagues in a tight situation. Next slide, please, Claire. So this is what Della, the steward who was on the princess princess ship, said. You don't realise till you've gone to sea that you can have such a laugh. Life was one big party. You had to be a family on there because you've got nowhere else to go. It's just nice to know that you, at that time, are being fully accepted. So you can see how laughter helps the bonding. Next slide, please, Claire. This is about music now, why making and hearing it can help us feel good. Releases emotions communally, it's great. Um, hearing or making music together rather than alone can be even more enjoyable. Remembered pleasure uh, is really important to adding to a sense of joy and ease and self-acceptance. So people might feel reminded of their favourite Broadway musical or reminded of home and family sing songs. If it's a funny spoof of a straight number, then it might be more, even more enjoyable to those with a shared culture. For example, the gay community with all its in-jokes. And music also encourages our predictions about what's coming next. For example, if you feel, oh, it's another great cruise show, your brain rewards you with a, a dopamine surge. So there's a real biochemical response to uh, music on ships from Wendy's piano, the knees up style, and two big musicals. Next slide, please, Claire. So just thinking about Wendy and his music making, on the one hand, even just getting off in the ship, getting off the ship in the Netherlands for a quick turnaround, uh, he would go into any place that had a bar that would let him play. And he said he couldn't get enough of playing the piano. It was my escape from everything. So here was Wendy really gaining as a maker of music. And on the other hand, the lieutenant commander who was at the head of the Paris on the Norland when he was going out to the Falklands said that Para 2 had this secret weapon, Wendy. And uh, he was really, Wendy was really appreciated by the Paris. He really made a difference to morale. Next slide, please, Claire. So watching and making shows, shows, theatrical shows like the musicals helped because live theatre is so good at boosting empathy and pro-social behaviour. Collective experiences are even more powerful than things you just watch alone. You can think of perhaps being in a theatre and the pleasure of that by comparison to just watching something on the telly on your own at home. And also it's well known that fiction helps alter people's beliefs and behaviour towards each other. It can bring understandings of the other, including gay people. And as makers, theatre making helped because the performers got the chance to be somebody else. They got to try on new identities, a new identity every show. Uh, it was a great way to gain a fan base. So people would come and they'd be your stage door johnnies. In effect, you would get new lovers, particularly if you were a very glamorous star, of a female star of a show. Uh, dressing up anyway is liberating and escapism as I know when I dress up as a woman pirate. And also the people who assisted the performers, like the dressers or like the electricians or the people who put the needle on the gramophone to play the music, they had a sense of contributing to this transformative mass experience. 
Next slide, please, Claire. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's a new recognition of how important mental health is at sea. One of the people involved in this is Dr. Rachel Glyn Williams, whose companies include Seaways Psych Psychology Services. And she says this, this very important summary, worse things do sometimes happen at sea. So connectivity between seafarers is such an important buffer to the challenges of life. Singing and making theatre sociably together where you can be yourself or even someone else can be such an antidote and a relief. She says important psychological safety can develop when all ranks are daring themselves to experience vulnerability, to take risks, encourage one another, give and receive authentic feedback. You know, like you were great in that show. Um, safer operations, safer interpersonal environments, business continuity, playing is serious business. Rachel says, everyone wins. Next slide, please, Claire. So these entertainment workers like Wendy and Larry were acting as therapeutic agents. The term is now used by nursing historians, particularly when they're thinking about nurses in World War II working out in the African desert with very little equipment. So they were offering ad hoc help in the absence of professionals. And I will point out that even now, uh, even big cruise ships don't have therapists aboard. It's the doctor's job or nobody's. Or maybe it's the barman who listens to somebody's story over the bar. So people creatively make do with what's available. In the case of ships, uh, crepe paper or uh, ball dresses made out of black bin liners. Stewards being emotion workers, dealing with passenger needs, already understood human needs. So I think they were well placed in being uh, therapeutic agents. And it's worth saying, in case you didn't get this, that the majority of makers were gay, bi and trans guys. So they had, at that time, they had known the pain of having a stigmatized identity and they'd learned how to help themselves and others cope with this tricky situation of being so othered. Next slide, please, Claire. So where do gays fit into this picture? Next slide, Claire. They benefited from the entertainments, feeling visible and positive and being associated with joy and pleasure and glamorous stylish enough. And it was time off from the business of coping with a homophobic world. And they gave benefit with their, their wit, their very glamorous frocks, Bernard Delfont, the theatrical impresario, actually sent hampers of Folie Berger outfits to one ship to help them dress up all the more stylishly. Um, it was well recognized, even as early as World War I, that uh, femininity really helped uh, men far away from home. They needed that, that balance. Uh, and so when women went out as entertainers in World War I, they would be wearing their prettiest pink satin dresses. And Vera Lynn got quite criticized in World War II for wearing khaki trousers instead of a frock. People wanted her to look like an embodiment of femininity to give them a change from the difficulty, the daily difficulty. Um, LGBT people or GBT people often really like um, Divas, Dusty Springfield, Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland, these were terribly important figures in the lives of the guys on Queer Heavens in this early period. And so uh, the entertainers could create opportunities to dream of being or getting to know uh, a diva of that extensive fame. And also just practically, uh, in a time when there was still such ignorance of LGBT life, uh, the gays were important because they were visible, they were educating, they were an antidote to the misery of uh, black and white movies and the newspaper coverage of queers as um, troubled, sick people. Next slide, please, Claire. 
So um, I asked Della, did it feel theatrical? And he said that being at Sea on Gay Heavens was one big theatre show because you you were on show all the time, you as a queer uh, service worker. No passenger wants to see a miserable person. And Della said gays were liked because everyone likes a laugh and a smile. Gays were liked in a humorous, welcoming way, not in a sexual way. If you've got somebody walking down corridors in an evening gown going, hello, dear, uh, or whatever, then whoopee, it just makes people laugh and people like to laugh. Next slide, please, Claire. So key points, seafarers needs and shipping company opportunism brought worker entertainments, worker entertainers and thereby mental well-being. Many gay seafarers happened to be ha both happy to entertain and good at it too. And the bonus was that entertaining helped in manage homophobia and heteronormativity in what can be a powder keg, a trouble ship. Next slide, please, Claire. I'm nearly there. Conclusions. Next slide. So Wendy and Larry and others helped by diverting people, helping give audience uh, a voice together, increasing camaraderie, joking, and in particular, Wendy didn't seem like a serious threat to hegemonic masculinity. His, and his style gave homophobes a chance to rethink their ideas about queer men. Uh, Larry helped the team, Larry was a perfectionist because he was rather trained, helped the team develop a great sense of themselves as theatrical artists and to learn new ideas about their strength as entertainers. And because of his high standards, he offered unexpectedly uplifting high quality art for a seafaring situation. So both these seafarers helped enhance gay visibility and generated new, very positive ideas about LGBT people at a homophobic time. They transformed voyages and lives. Next slide, please, Claire. Um, for the, 20, the 30th anniversary of the Falklands conflict, uh, there was a big event in Frankie's Vauxhall Tavern in Hull, which is gone now, both Frankie and Wendy uh, were there. Frankie was a steward on the Northern too, and the Paras were there too. Uh, afterwards, Wendy was made into an honorary Para. That's a gold plaque to him in the Paris Goose Green Cemetery. So there was this honoring of gay, as they were referred to, seafarer entertainers who inspired kindness and help people cross the divide from homophobia into understanding a bit better. Next slide, please, Claire. So if you get your phones out, uh, these are uh, some books you might like to read about the subject. And there's a video you can see of Wendy being interviewed in 2021, down at the bottom there. Next slide, please, Claire. Um, do get in touch with me if you want to talk about this. I'm really happy to talk about this happy and effective time. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your comments and questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jo. <clears throat> um, just a reminder, if uh, people do have questions, if you could please type them into the, um, the questions box and I'll, um, I'll ask them on your behalf. It's a way of saving technological confusion. Um, we do have one to start off with, which is, do we know of other gay seafarers in 1982, especially aboard the really big ships, um, the Canberra, the QE2 and so on? Sorry, do I know them? No, do, do we know of um, other, because the, the ones they're, you talked about. They're, they're, not the whole... so, they're not so well known. I've interviewed them, but, um, but they're not so well known. In fact, even Larry isn't well known. Wendy is definitely the most famous gay seafarer of the Falklands War. Well, a question from me then, since that exhausts what's in the questions box for the time being, is that particularly the, the entertainment among crews, not so much for the benefit of passengers, was there a sort of gently subversive dimension to this sometimes? Was it used as a sort of way of gently poking fun at 
authority figures, I'm thinking particularly officers, in a, a sort of faintly acceptable way? Yeah, there was. This, this is one of these permitted interludes where the high can become no, the low can become high. So yes, there was a subversive element and it was quite cheeky. And I remember one particular example where um, on the programme for one of the variety shows, uh, there were thank yous to various people like the electrician. And there was one jokey thank you to Captain Smith, we'll call him, Captain Smith's mum for allowing him to come out and play with them. Oh, right. So it was used occasionally so, as a way of gently poking fun at. Uh... Yeah. So I mean, a, a, a captain would 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 go uh, and be in the audience, and some captains would even shove balloons up their their jackets and play like pantomime James. Not too much because they had to keep their authority, um, and I guess it was easier for the captain to be a bit outrageously pantomimey because he was so high he didn't lose authority for quite a junior officer he would have had to be quite careful about how feminine he was appearing to be it was a very tricky balance for the officers who really couldn't afford to be out they would lose their jobs mm, very much so any questions we've not got any more in the, the questions box well, I'm going to abuse chair's privilege in that case and ask what may be the final question, Joe, which is obviously the period you were talking about is the 1950s through to the 80s. And since then, we've seen um, a huge change in the sort of composition of the seafaring workforce, in particular, which mu much more multi-ethnic, multinational crews. How has and that women. affected this? Yeah. And where, yes, indeed. And women. How has that affected the sort How's of How has that affected that? the behaviour? Well, um, more the sort of entertainment you've been talking about. I mean, what, what sort of effects has it had? Well, some of the big changes have meant that crew have single cabins now. So there's no longer the collectivity, the partying, the, the playing music with a gang of you. So people will be sitting in their cabins with their headphones on, listening to something they're hearing on YouTube, perhaps. So there's a lot of distance. There's not the solidarity. Um, on, on the cruise ships, on the floating palaces, there are professional entertainers now with very, very high standard costumes, singing and dancing. And so there isn't the same opportunity for crew to make shows it, because it just wouldn't be good enough. People's taste has become so sophisticated. Um, obviously, Filipino crew are famous for having karaoke shows. So I think there's a huge amount of Filipino self-entertainment down in the lower levels of the ship. Um, I've been lectured on a couple of cruise ships when uh, there have been variety shows and there has been as many as two Filipino people allowed to do karaoke. But generally, you know, crew mucking about in shows and professional entertainment do not mix. No, that makes sense. A question, well, comments. Oh, a question. Sorry, yeah, but I should say also there can be there can be camp, the informal campery that I talked about. So uh, often the people in the entertainment teams are gay themselves. So there's a lot of innuendo by the compares of shows. Uh, it's quite okay to be out in that entertainment sphere of the ship. Yep. We have one thing has just popped up a comment and a question in the chat box, so I shall, shall read this out. Um, such wonderful accounts of camaraderie and gently challenging personal beliefs. Thank you, Joe, um, and all those accounts you've, you've represented, very moving. Do you think that internet connectivity in modern seafaring would impact seafarers' real life connectivity and readiness to flex their beliefs and assumptions about one another? Brilliant question. It is, isn't it? Could you just read the second bit of again? Do I think? By all means. Do you think that internet connectivity in modern seafaring would impact seafarers' real life connectivity and readiness to flex their beliefs and assumptions about one another? Yeah, gosh, that's a huge question. Um, I'm really pro connectivity. 
I, th I think one of the ironic benefits of non-connectivity may be that people do choose to do some self-entertainment in the absence of anything else. I can see that being able to watch a show together on YouTube and to sing along with it perhaps might really enhance the jollity, but really, I think the culture has so changed away from self-entertainment now that um, it, it, it's it's a different world to the world it was then in the 50s, 60s and 70s. The habit of jollity really is, is not there anymore, I think. I wish I wasn't saying that. <laughs> Okay, any further questions? Well, if not, then all that remains for me to do is to say two thank yous. Um, the first is a big thank you to Claire behind the scenes, who's um, managed all of this brilliantly. So a great big thank you to you, Claire. Um, and also a very big thank you to Joe for um, a presentation I thoroughly enjoyed. I hope those listening enjoyed it too. Um, so yes, thank you very much and um, and good night. Thank you all. Hope to hear from you. And thank you, Martin, for chairing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.